I'm uh, Steve, part from uh, Korea, Asam Medical Center. Uh, thank you all for joining us for uh, 26 TCCAP uh, 2021 virtual. Uh, uh, this session is a hot topic for the main and health occasion. Right. Um, we have very uh, distinguished panelists here. Um, Dr. Budoyaki, Dr. Chen, uh, James Larry, Raji Patin, and people uh, here. So you want to start uh, the part of that main and multi-vessel PTI. So first talk uh, will give us Dr. Doug Uba from Asian Medical Center, very long-term outcome of the main PTI Pioneer Center's experience. Dr. Buckley. Okay, thank you. Thank you, SJ, and thank you and everyone and every audience and every discussion and panelist. The, today, my first talk, I'm going to talking about the very long-term outcome of Lemmain PCI. Uh, this is a Pioneer Center experience, 10 minute uh, brief talking. So this is my disclosure. And uh, uh, might be this is uh, the nearly first paper 25 years ago and the publication in the Jack 1998 and the SJ Park. Uh, participate in this uh, Jack uh, uh, Arik, original article and the background the rapid main diseases regarding the absolute contraindication for coronary angioplasty at this time. At the time, Gary Minch and Martin Leung is participate in this uh, the nearly original article. So, and uh, uh, this is a representative figure shows the rotavulation and then put the Parma Shot to stand uh, 998 and uh, our team also shows uh, participate a lot of uh, live case demonstration, especially for lemme and PCI. And uh, I, I'm sure definitely in the Asam Medical Center representative study it came from the lab main PCI and revascularization. We published a uh, uh, lot of uh, you know, article from the registry and uh, some random trial, including pre-combat and uh, uh, the uh, you know, main compare study and the publication, more than 300 publication. So, and the long journey of the lab main PCI, our team also contributed to this journey. And uh, we tried to diminish outcome gap between PCI and pipe surgery in lab main PCI. And so, and uh, this year, lab main PCI versus pipe surgery and the inpatient low and the intermediate risk anatomical complexity, PCI definitely showed the similar mortality and serious composite outcome. PCI associate high risk repeat revascularization, low risk stroke compared to bypass surgery. What is one the main thing we require very long term outcome data? The reason why there was some signal and the observational registry and some clinical trial shows some uh, crossover and late catch up. The reason why we require more long term data. We look back our representative data. This is the main compare registry and the real world registry. We published the three year New England Journal of Medicine and report five year Jack and 10 year Jack. And this is a, a 10 year report published the Jack key message. And the five, uh, after five year, all cause of mortality, serious composite outcome, favor bypass surgery. However, our study, just observational study, we think about interpretation should be provisional. And the, some of the key subgroup analysis, this is the main compare registry compared to diabetic without diabetics. And the overall, the outcome was much higher in diabetic group compared to non-diabetic group. There was no difference PCI versus bypass surgery and the diabetic the discriminate capacity for PCI and uh, KBG is limited and the p-value interaction was not significant. Also, we made some editorial. This is a key sub-study diabetic in Excel trial. And the, in our editorial, look back the P interaction, several clinical trial, according to diabetic and non-diabetic, there was no significant interaction just except IPD meta-analysis, just multivessel disease group. So another key study is a syntax score evaluation in main compare registry and key finding high syntax score by pet surgery was better. However, main compare study include much, much complex uh, uh, real world uh, patients favoring pipette surgery might be this is not directly applicable to random trial. And uh, this is a uh, recently paper, the region location, left main uh, uh, bifurcation versus uh, also region key finding, also a sharp region, there was no difference. 
PCI versus bypass surgery, but bifurcation region beyond the five years treatment effect was favor bypass surgery over PCI. And the, for this article, is the, our the moderator Antonio Colombo make an editorial. The key part is we think about uh, you know left main bifurcation should not be regarded as dichotomous variable. We should think about a lot of another things. Uh, uh, left main, the concomitant disease, diabetic surgical factor, and circum artery size also conflict or incomplete revascularization. We're gonna move to our random trial, pre-combat two-year published in New England Random Journal of Medicine, five-year jet. And uh, recently we uh, published a pre-combat 10-year report, primary endpoint death semi-stroke, ischemic driven TBR, there is no statistical difference, all cause mortality nearly identical, hazard ratio 1.13, same. And the key subgroup analysis, pre-combat 10-year is a uh, sub-analysis according to diabetic status, nearly same. And that there is no p-value interaction, uh, PCI versus bypass surgery according to diabetic or non-diabetic. This is a uh, Jaha re revision status. Also, syntax score and uh, our pre-combat uh, uh, population much more, much lower complexity compared to main compare registry. And we did not found any discriminative capacity of syntax score for treatment effect uh, after PCI versus bypass surgery. What is the remaining issue? Lamp main bifurcation PCI. Um, I think about lamp main also sharp is nearly the same. And lamp main bifurcation region, we should think about more things. And uh, how can we diminish outcome gap between PCI bypass surgery for distal lamp main? We require different PCI concept and technique. This is Gregson paper is a well summarized what portion we should be focused PCI procedure guidance and adjunctive pharmacology and patient selection and pre procedural planning. We call this is a contemporary state of the art PCI that is a make a, a PCI outcome uh, could be equivalent to bypass surgery with the concept of functional and imaging the, uh, concept. So what is remain the things and the time for guideline update current available guideline is published uh, pre uh, Excel and Noble era and ES guideline mainly based on syntax score and the current US guideline nearly eight years ago already old fashioned. We wait the next version of a new guideline. This is my last slide. Pioneer Center thought on lab main PCI. Current available data shows PCI was comparable to bypass surgery with regard to serious composite outcome and all cause mortality for lamb main disease and low to intermediate anatomy complexity. Optimal choice of a PCI, presence of lamb main disease should not be considered dichotomous variable. We think about more things, clinical comorbidity and another higher atherosclerotic burden. And the lastly, most of the clinicians are now expecting updated guideline change on the basis of long-term data of a random market trial. Thank you for your attention. Great, great, nice uh, summary uh, from the, our data. Okay, uh, we're gonna move second, uh, you know, talk. Uh, Dr. Greg Stone will give us uh, the main PCI versus cavity Excel trial final leader. Greg, please. So I slightly changed my talk title, um, left main PCI versus cabbage from the final Excel outcomes to patient recommendations, because that's what's really important. I have no relevant disclosures with any stent manufacturers. So the XL trial is the largest study to date of left main PCI versus cabbage, the most contemporary with contemporary drug eluting stents. And it was a total of 1,905 patients with low and intermediate syntax scores that were randomized to Zion's ever relevant eluting stents. So the um, primary endpoint was the composite incidence of death MI or stroke at a median follow-up of three years. And again, this was 1,905 randomized patients. This is the only trial to date that's been powered to not have revascularization in the primary endpoint, which is of much less importance than death MI or stroke. And this was the primary endpoint. And there was no significant difference at, of death MI or stroke at follow-up at three years, about 15% rate in both arms. This is the only thing that Excel was powered to show. This is the take-home message from Excel. 
Everything else, we had a few secondary powered endpoints, but most other endpoints are either underpowered or exploratory, including the five-year endpoint. The five-year endpoint was not a powered endpoint, Point, but if we look at death stroke or myocardial infarction, we again see no significant difference. But we do see the fact that they're, the curves are crossing and that these are non-proportional hazards. So early on, the outcomes seem somewhat better with PCI than cabbage. Later on, they seem somewhat better with cabbage than PCI. So when you have non-proportional hazards, you, how do you analyze them? Well, the first thing you do is you look at the data to see where within the data are the hazards proportional. And you could find three different periods. In the first 30 days, there was about a 40% reduction in death MI or stroke with PCI compared to cabbage. From one month to one year, the curves were superimposable. And then from one year to five years, the curves were diverging, favoring cabbage over PCI. So what do you tell an overall patient? You'll do better early on with PCI, you'll do better later with cabbage. So you can look at the overall number of days event-free, which is basically the area between the curve using a technique called the restricted mean survival time analysis. And you can see that early on, you accrue more and more days of being event-free after PCI, but then later on that's eaten up by more events after PCI. And at the end of the day, at the end of five years, if you got randomized to PCI instead of cabbage, you were five days more likely to be free of a death, a stroke, or MI within five years. But the confidence interval you can see is very wide. So there's obviously no major significant difference between death stroke or MI within the Excel trial at five years. So how do we um, translate these and other findings to a patient? And that's where the heart team comes into play. And the purpose of the heart team is to try to synthesize all this complex nuanced data and to explain it to the patient so he or she can understand the relative risks and benefits of different procedures so you can propel the patient to their goals in life because it's ultimately their choice. So when you look at what patients actually care about, it's somewhat different than what physicians care about. Physicians think that death is the most important endpoint. There's nothing close to as important. Stroke and large myocardial infarction are of half as importance. And repeat revascularization and rehospitalization is relatively unimportant. But if you look at what patients feel, patients feel that large MI and stroke in particular are at least as important as death. They do agree that repeat revascularization and rehospitalization are of lesser importance. So we really have to look at these three endpoints when we are really able to give patients the best information. So is mortality different between left main PCI versus cabbage? And no single trial is powered for mortality. So that's where we've got to look at meta-analysis, aggregate all of the data. And when you look at all the studies that have long-term follow-up of PCI, DES, versus cabbage for left main disease, you see absolutely no difference in all-cause mortality or cardiac mortality. And here are the curves. Um, and you can look at a red curve for PCI, blue curves for cabbage of the four main trials with five-year follow-up. And in some of these graphs, the red curve is a little above the blue curve and the other, the blue curve is a little above the red curve. If there are any differences, they are very small. You're talking talking about half percent per year differences. And you have to keep the relative differences into account as what the absolute differences into account as well as the relative differences. Obviously there's no differences in all cause mortality. And then you say, well, we always hear that PCI will fail late and that's the big benefit of surgery, but we now have the syntax left main to 10 years and the curves are perfectly parallel between five and 10 years for mortality and the same with pre-combat. And in neither trial, is there any difference in 10 year mortality? So the bottom line is for most patients with left main versus PCI that were eligible for these randomized trials, mortality to at least 10 years is very similar. What about stroke rates? Well, early on, stroke is clearly less with PCI compared to cabbage, but this is a small difference. It's a big relative difference, two thirds reduction in stroke. But I, I don't think it's fair for us to crow about that because the overall absolute difference is about 0.8%. It's still there at one year. When we look out to five years, it's no longer statistically significant in part because of a dilution effect over time, but also because of Noble, which was outlier showing more strokes with PCI. So the bottom line is there are fewer strokes with PCI than cabbage and particularly early on, but it's not a big number. And it probably shouldn't be the only reason that patients choose one therapy versus the other, unless they're a particularly high risk for stroke. What about myocardial infarction? 
there's no overall difference in the rates of myocardial infarction between PCI and cabbage for left main disease, but there is a difference in the timing of the MIs. There are fewer procedural MIs after PCI and fewer non-procedural or late MIs after cabbage. Cabbage is a more durable procedure and likely by bypassing more treated disease than PCI is able to stent, it does have a uh, effect on reducing MI, particularly by probably treating vulnerable plaques. And then finally, patients care about quality of life. They want to live longer, they want to be free of stroke and MI, and they want to feel better. And this is where obviously patients will tend to want to choose PCI over cabbage because it's so much of an easier procedure. And we were able to quantitate this in Excel by looking at a pre-specified difference of major adverse events, which is reduced by 72% with PCI compared to cabbage. Not only these major endpoints like stroke and MI, but also bleeding, transfusions, um, ventricular and atrial arrhythmias, those requiring cardioversion, pacemakers, repeat procedures, renal failure, infections, sepsis, prolonged intubation, obviously PCI is an easier procedure. And this translates to a difference in quality of life early on. PCI patients within 30 days are feeling substantially better, whereas bypass surgery patients within 30 days are actually feeling a little bit worse than if they had had the procedure. But then there's a catch up. So by one year and then three years, there's no difference in quality of life between these two procedures. And both of the procedures are very effective at reducing angina. Perhaps PCI a tiny bit more at 30 days, maybe because some of this is misclassified as sternal chest pain. But then when you go out beyond one year, both procedures are very good at relieving angina. These patients almost become asymptomatic. So I think it comes down to what I call obvious choices versus equipoise. And we have to use some common sense. The data is close enough that You've got to look at the individual characteristics of each individual patient that is clinical and angiographic and then take their preferences into account. So here's a patient with an isolated osteolift left main lesion and the rest of the coronary tree is essentially normal. And um, I would argue this patient very, very strongly should have a PCI. If the patient absolutely insisted on bypass, okay, maybe. But obviously the patients I would say should have a PCI. Here's on the other hand, a patient that was randomized in the syntax trial with a 99% left main, a 99% approximate LAD and occluded circuit and occluded right, okay? You would be insane to do a PCI on this patient. And this patient clearly should have cabbage and anyone that would recommend other, uh, other I think, even if the patient wanted PCI, you should decline. And then finally, there's everything in between. A relatively non-complex distal left main lesion with just some diffuse disease in the remainder of the left and a focal right stenosis. Most interventionalists should be able to handle this. You could offer patients either PCI or cabbage, depending on their preferences. And here's a somewhat more complicated case with a distal left main trifurcation and then other lesions in the tree. This would be an intermediate uh, to high risk syntax score. And this would depend, I think, on the experience and expertise of the interventionalist compared to the surgeon, as well as the patient's preferences. And there's everything in between. So in the Bottom line, um, to try to you know, apoliticize this, and unfortunately the subspecialties have made it very political, but we have to bring it back to the patient with heart team discussions and let the patient know that these are two very different procedures. PCI has early advantages, it's less invasive, there's fewer procedural complications, there's lower 30-day MACE, there's more rapid recovery with better early quality of life and early angina relief. On the other hand, bypass surgery has late advantages. It's more durable. There's fewer adverse events beyond one year, especially MI and repeat revascularization. For the majority of the patients, there's not going to be a major difference in long-term survival, MACE, or quality of life. So for the majority of cases, you have to explain all this to the patient and understand if they want upfront procedure being easier versus long-term durability, what their preferences are. Uh, but for some cases, the choice is very clear. Thank you very much. Great talk. All right. Thank you. All right. We're going to move uh, short uh, lectures. Uh, Dr. Dev Gamjari uh, will give us uh, complex distal limb limb bifurcation PCIs, issue, concerns, and dilemma. David?
Thank you, SJ. It's a privileged opportunity to be with all of you uh, as part of TCTAP and to follow two great uh, presentations on long-term clinical outcomes. My charge is to address the unmet needs and dilemmas still related to the distal left main bifurcation. Very much unlike this cartoon with the surgeon stating, let's just start cutting and see what happens. Instead, the path, the story path of left main PCI has been one of dedication to advancement of technology, including drug eluting stents, skill sets and procedural technique and its refinement, and especially to the creation of a large evidence basis of relative outcomes to bypass surgery, a historical standard, as well as quality of life and even economic outcomes. Specific to the left main bifurcation, however, like other non-left main bifurcation disease, extensive observational and some limited randomized data would suggest that a single stent method or provisional approach may be favored over a planned two stent method for uniformly all bifurcation disease. And indeed, the temporal trends in left main PCI would endorse these data in more than a 25 year experience from the Asan Medical Center a world leader in left main PCI. There's a progression of increasing left main stent PCI, but also an increasing uh, prevalence of single stent or, or provisional approaches rather than a dedicated two stent method. But nevertheless, a two stent method is required in at least a quarter of left main PCI cases. And this may be because of significant side branch disease determined angiographically or hemodynamically, extensive disease length or extension into the side branch, most commonly the left circumflex artery, or perhaps corinal shift secondary to a very narrow bifurcation angle. And yet when a two stent method is required, the technique historically has been principally driven by operator or institutional preference rather than by any supportive data. And in the Excel trial, for instance, two stent methods were required in a third of the cases most commonly related to T or T and protrusion techniques followed by culotte and other, com other, other commonly used techniques. Again, principally driven by operator skill sets or preference. With regard to a two versus a single stent technique for distal bifurcation disease from the Excel trial, we've demonstrated that the outcomes over three year follow-up of death of myocardial infarction and of stroke are similar, or excuse me, are, are statistically uh, higher for a two-stent technique compared with a provisional technique. And this is especially so with the inclusion of the outcome of repeat revascularization, though importantly, most commonly repeat revascularization is driven by non-left main disease. On the other hand, however, when we apply more carefully the definition somewhat uh, similar to that of the definition trial of true bifurcation disease, and we examine outcomes to the presence of a two versus a single stent technique for true bifurcation disease, when there is side branch involvement or involvement in both limbs of the bifurcation and a two-stent method is applied, these outcomes are more similar to those outcomes when a single-stent method is used. And yet, on the other hand, when there is not uh, the presence of true bifurcation disease and a two-stent method is applied, this is associated with the highest adverse event rate. One two-stent method that deserves a special uh, editorialism is the double kiss crush technique that certainly procedurally facilitates side branch recrossing after kissing balloon inflation in the second stent placement. With regard to the clinical evidence in non-left main disease, the DK crush may demonstrate superior outcomes with regard to target lesion revascularization, both compared to alternative two-stent methods such as culotte technique or provisional method. And specific to unprotected left main disease, there appears to be superiority even through three years of follow-up with regard to target lesion failure, even stent thrombosis and target lesion revascularization compared with selected two-stent methods or a provisional technique. Recently, two meta-analyses with the DK crush technique have been published and expectedly with each individual trial demonstrating favorable outcomes, more favored outcomes with the DK crush technique. The meta-analysis is certainly in favor of this, suggesting even lower MI rates compared with a conventional crush technique. Indeed, by the European guidelines, the DK crush technique is the only method that has a recommendation, albeit a level 2B, over provisional T stenting, but importantly, the European Bifurcation Club still recommends a provisional approach as a default technique. Some of the limitations with the DK crush technique include that it has still today little external validation, that most of these trials have come from the same group of operators who have extensive experience with this method. There's also been variable techniques such as kissing balloon inflations 
across the comparator arms and also associated with higher, unusually higher worse outcomes in the comparator arms, at least in selected trials. And there's also perhaps an uncertain impact of angiographic surveillance on, these, on, on some of these endpoints as well. But we've, we've addressed when a two-stent method may be required in distal bifurcation disease, but with regard to the provisional approach, which remains the mainstay for left main PCI, what we recognize is that almost uniformly when a single stent method is applied, there is consistently side branch distortion, elliptical deformation at the origin of the side branch, again, most commonly the circumflex artery, and despite the angiographic appearance, hemodynamically, oftentimes there is a, a result that is above the ischemic threshold. What's controversial still about the provisional technique, however, is whether kissing balloon strategies do yield benefit or not. There is a suggestion that side branch restenosis in the non-stented side branch with balloon angioplasty may be reduced, but it actually may increase the risks for main stent, main vessel stent, instant restenosis. And what's certainly un unclear is what the long-term outcome is when there is an acceptable FFR result in a, in a large side branch, such as a dominant left circumflex artery that is above the ischemic threshold. But again, you're starting out from the end of the procedure with a reduction in the minimal luminal area. One area of interest for distal bifurcation disease that has gained recent attention, albeit still limited, is with regard to the bifurcation angle and more, more specifically the, the change in the bifurcation angle pre and post PCI, that is the change in the bifurcation angle being the change between the range of systole and diastole. A wider bifurcation angle is associated with a greater distal disease burden, perhaps. We know that distal bifurcation disease is also interestingly associated with a higher disease prevalence of non-left main disease. And there's a suggestion then that a pre-procedural bifurcation angle may predict outcome with regard to distal left main disease more than, more than the post-PCI bifurcation angle. That is, with a two-stent method, a restriction in the natural bifurcation angle may impose uh, a restriction in the natural vessel hinge motion or vessel configuration that could imply strain and may be associated with higher rates of target lesion revascularization. Whatever the mechanism may be, however, whether it is with a two stent or a single stent method, the origin of the circumflex artery remains the Achilles heel for distal left main bifurcation disease associated with consistently higher rates of both angiographic and clinical restenosis. And indeed, under expansion of the stent in a two stent method is the most common reason for this uh, observation. Again, at the origin of the circumflex artery occurring in nearly 40% of the cases and then approximately one half of these cases will eventuate in clinical restenosis. Here's such an example of a case that I've performed that in angiographically after a two stent method and in multiple views, there's a very acceptable result. But when we perform intravascular ultrasound, despite high pressure sequential post inflation, there's still marked under expansion toward the lower right hand corner at the origin of the circumflex artery that is only partially mitigated by albeit uh, intentionally oversized non-compliant balloons in the, in the, at the origin of the circumflex artery itself. To be sure, there have been studies demonstrating with intravascular imaging, minimal luminal thresholds that at least in certain geographies have been escalated to achieve a, a higher MLA, a higher minimal stent area to mitigate against the risks of angiographic and clinical restenosis. Also as a validation of this from the Excel trial, albeit as of yet unpublished, the achievement of a minimal stent area in the left main itself greater than nine millimeters squared was associated with numerically lower repeat revascularization, but interestingly, significantly lower stent thrombosis, all cause mortality and a composite of major adverse events. One area that's also with regard to the distal bifurcation come under recent contest has been uh, kissing balloon inflation. This is a commonplace procedure fundamental to bifurcation disease to reduce stent malapposition, to achieve greater stent expansion as I've introduced, reorient the carina, perhaps improve shear st stress patterns that may have an implication in repeat revascularization. But interestingly, in the Excel trial, in the two stent cases, kissing balloon inflation was performed in 85% of the cases, so not uniformly. And interestingly, in the single stent cases, kissing balloon inflation was performed in 60% of the cases. And in the Excel trial, albeit by, by no means a randomized experience, we demonstrated through four years, no benefit in either single or two stent cases with kissing balloon inflation. But on the other hand, 
uh, a larger, a large registry from the Rain Cardio Group recently demonstrated in, in which about a third of the cases were left main disease, that kissing balloon uh, consistent with the totality of evidence reduced target lesion revascularization in the two stent cases, but interestingly, no benefit even with regard to, to target lesion revascularization in the side branch in the provisional cases. Proximal optimization very briefly also remains a fundamental part of left main bifurcation disease given the tapering appearance of the left main. And again, aside from kissing balloon inflation, proximal optimization reduces the likelihood of stent malapposition in the more proximal segments of the left main, as well as improves stent endothelialization. All of this discussion highlights the benefits of intravascular imaging, which, uh, which in the context of randomized trials for non-left main disease demonstrate benefit also from the British cardiovascular intervention study suggests that it, the application of intravascular imaging has an importance with regard to long-term survival uh, as in this experience uh, through one year follow-up and is independent of operator volume or experience. It also results in fewer procedural complications and in-hospital outcomes aside from longer-term survival. Now with regard to the distal bifurcation and longer-term outcomes, uh, Greg and DW both have shared long-term outcomes from the left main uh, randomized trials and single arm studies, but specifically to the comparison of osteo and shaft disease versus distal bifurcation disease, uh, Tony Gershlich demonstrated that through longer term follow-up for osteo shaft disease, as Greg implied in his case example, the outcomes are at parity, even including the composite of unplanned revascularization. But when we include distal bifurcation disease from the Excel trial, at least through longer term follow-up, there remains parity with regard to death MI or stroke, but there is a higher rate of repeat of unplanned revascularization. But again, um, less, least commonly related to the left main territory itself. And this is in the context, however, of even longer term follow-up as DW briefly introduced from the main compare study, suggesting that even through 10 years of follow-up, osteo and shaft disease has comparable outcomes of death MI and stroke. But on the other hand, for bifurcation disease, left main bifurcation disease compared with bypass surgery, there may be a, a, an inflection point after five years with a higher rate of mortality and major adverse events similar at five years for bifurcation disease, but then exceeding bypass surgery for bifurcation disease specifically over longer term follow-up. My last comment will also be with regard to left main operator experience, an issue raised by the British Cardiovascular Intervention Society and Tim Kinnaird in this comment, and specifically uh, in the United States, for example, from the ACC and the NCDR registry, unprotected left main PCI remains relegated oftentimes to very high risk or acuity cases or surgical turndown cases in patients with greater comorbidity. And indeed operator experience remains very low with the far majority of operators uh, and, and hospitals performing uh, very few le unprotected left main PCI procedures. And this experience or the importance of operator experience is at least suggested from the Fu Y experience in which high volume operators defined as performing at least 15 PCI procedures per year for the past three consecutive years have improved outcomes of cardiovascular death independent of whether the distal bifurcation is involved, independent of whether it is a single stent or a two stent technique or whether intravascular imaging is applied. In summary then, as emerging evidence demonstrates equipoise between revascularization strategies of left main disease, our attention in turns to the important details of stent selection and technique, dual antiplatelet therapy, perhaps clinical surveillance, uh, other issues that are very pertinent to routine clinical practice. The determinants of a two stent left main strategy and method certainly include disease severity and extent and perhaps the bifurcation angle, but whether a single stent or, or two stent method is applied for distal bifurcation disease imaging, hemodynamic assessment, and operator experience seem increasingly imperative. The outstanding issues in a two-stent left main bifurcation strategy include the technique, still with outstanding questions regarding the DK crush technique. In part, this may be uh, further resolved or at least provided insight to by the EBC main trial that has completed enrollment comparing a two-stent versus a provisional method in true bifurcation disease. But ultimately, failure to have complete resolution of these issues doesn't should not prohibit our advancement of left main PCI as an important therapeutic alternative to bypass surgery, at least in selected patients, but it certainly can improve the outcome. Thank you. 
Great, thank you, David. All right, uh, we are uh, uh, gonna have a uh, 10 minute or um, more than 10 minute uh, uh, discussion uh, uh, time. So about the three uh, distinguished lectures. And so what about the, from the panel? Um, any uh, discussion point for that? Yeah, if I can say. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, if I can say, I think it's a great presentation and a great overview of the current status of the field. I think, as um, um, Dr. Stone, Dr. Kanjari, Dr. Daku uh, uh, Park said, I mean, there's a lot of developments, but you know, for most patients, there is still the, the concern about, uh, um, in the United States at least, about the choice between uh, PCI. And I think most patients, and uh, maybe Greg and, and uh, um, uh, David, correct me if I'm wrong, still go for bypass. So, any thoughts from the experience from Korea and the other experience that we can potentially uh, affect that, and is that the right thing to do? Yeah, definitely. I think you know some decision making fissure versus bypass bypass surgery. We should consider lots of things, and the key part is uh, we think about the operational center experience. Uh, you know that was the same in South Korea and. Uh, I think it's, uh, even though patient has some complex uh, anatomy in, in experience center can do well in the not experience center, that is, I think, uh, some good point. I have a, the, uh, uh, one comment of that the, in the four or uh, left main uh, disease treatment. Actually, uh, uh, Dr. Park and Dr. Stone and uh, Dr. Kanjari uh, uh, presented a very excellent the uh, work of, based on uh, the evidence-based, but the, as a clinician, the, we, when we have a, a significant main disease, uh, at the time, uh, we have to be a uh, uh, hard team uh, discussion. But uh, I think that the priority should be uh, the uh, prepared. What I mean is that the more important of the hard team discussion is uh, the shared, discu uh, shared uh, discussion. What I mean is that the, uh, when I look at the uh, 220, the ACC and AHA guideline for the TABI, there is a, some comment, shared decision between a patient and the heart team. What I mean is uh, when we do a, have a heart team discussion with a surgeon in this patient, we have a very, very strong struggle of the, the surgeon's opinion. This patient is a left main disease, so they have to be a, take a, the bypass surgery. But the, what about the, the patient, the opinion? I don't want to take a, the uh, the surgery is a very strong. So it, we have to negotiate uh, that and we have an open mind. Okay, first of all, you, you need to uh, uh, take uh, the bypass surgery. But the, the first response uh, from the patient, is there any alternative treatment mod modality for my disease? And then we suggest that the alternative model is a PCI. And then explain frankly everything. What is that? There is a no difference of the MI, DAS, and stroke. Only difference was a revascularization. And the patient replies, okay, I will accept that. And their choice, usually PCI, lead than the bypass surgery. You know, one, one point I would like to make is, is that, um, you know, I think David nicely showed the paper from the NCDR here in the United States. The, the point I was going to make is that David had showed that paper from the NCDR and um, Jubo has shown how important operator experience is from Fuwai Hospital. When I was looking at the angiograms that Greg showed, the, um, the ability to do these cases in the United States is minimal. And that's the big, big challenge that we have here in the United States. Yeah, I agree with that, Ajay. I think, um, uh, I think the question came in, most patients choose cabbage. It's not that most patients choose cabbage. It's that either one, most patients are being told cabbage is their only option because the heart team doesn't function well and doesn't function honestly, to be very honest for you. But two, as or a bigger problem is that in the United States, where you've got the average operator is doing 30 PCIs a year, most operators are not developing the experience to do distal left main bifurcation disease, especially when there's other concomitant complex disease. So, uh, you know, God forbid, if they have a complication doing those cases, then they're really going to get in hot water at their local institutions. So it's much more socio-political 
um, than anything else. And unlike in the UK and in uh, uh, Asia, where there's tremendous experience doing these procedures, and they've become routine standard of care. Do we need centers of excellence for left main disease in the United States? It, for us, for us at our institution, uh, left main PCI is very, very common. I'll do several, yeah. several cases a month, uh, if not weekly. And and I think what's conditioned that experience for us was the trial that our referring uh, operators will do a diagnostic cath for left main disease and call us rather than the surgeons. But to be fair, we'll present it with the surgeons and um, and because of their experience from Excel and seeing what could be done with PCI. We'll sit down with the patient and have a discussion. And then um, to Dr. Fong's point, that's where the patient preference really comes into play in the patient selection of whether to do PCI or bypass surgery. Yeah, in China, I think uh, there's an uncomfortable truth about low volume operators, though. Certainly in the UK, a low volume operator is more likely to refer it to the surgeon than they are to a low to a high volume PCI operator. Right. And that's something we need to look at as a specialty and, and sort that out. You know, they shouldn't, that, that shouldn't happen. The patient actually is compromised by, frankly, the kind of personality of the operator. And I think that is an issue. I, I think that most of the time, the issue is not the left main, is the associated yeah. vessel disease. I mean, we keep on talking left main PCI, but if it was for the left main, PCI would be very simple. <laughs> yeah. The problem is the long LED, the bifurcation in the big diagonal, the occlusion of the right that you cannot open, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the left main per se is not such a big deal. Or to be able to get, get, or okay. the, the panel yeah. with Greg or and Tony, do you think the advances in medical therapy will change these long-term curves? We have a lot better drugs that may alter atherosclerosis favorably. I personally, I think that's going to help both procedures. Maybe it'll slightly help PCI relatively more for some of the untreated vulnerable plaques, but I don't think that's the main factor. I think it's these, these other issues that are more important. Hey. Yeah, in, China, in China, I think a hard team does not work together for every complex cases, including left main disease. But I have a question. I want to know if how team work together for every left main disease in US or in some countries? You know, in the US, it's very interesting. It's very institution dependent. So like David said, at our institution, we do a lot of left main. So the surgeons will refer us to cases. In fact, my most high, high yield referral for left main is the surgeons. But there are other institutions where the heart team never convenes and it doesn't, once you see left main in the cath lab, it goes directly to surgery. And if the surgeon says no, then it goes to medical therapy. It doesn't even go to PCI. Cool. So this concept of the heart team, while um, it makes sense and is good and is patient oriented, is really variable in terms of how it's actually practiced. Another important point uh, uh, regarding this uh, heart team approach, I think, Within the heart team, in individual uh, institution, hospital, the surgeon and the interventional cardiologist should be balanced. I mean, they can discuss, honestly discuss. Otherwise, uh, for example, in the majority of the uh, heart, heart center in China, I think uh, intervention cardiologists can do many, many complex uh, left main PCI, but uh, the surgeon's uh, outcome, maybe the surgery outcome may be worse. I don't know if I'm right, Shaolian. Yeah, okay. I think it's true. In China, you know, uh, some cardiac surgeons are not strong enough to do very complex cabbage. For example, for left man patient who have renal dysfunction or very low uh, ejection fraction. Really? Okay, great. Uh, next discussion. I, I would like to just to let you uh, let you know that our current series in the AMC, uh, we are uh, uh, in real world practice more than almost more than 80, 80% of what I made is within the multi vessel disease. Uh, we do PCI. Actually, we have a very strong heart wound 
even surgeons sometimes, you know, deliver transfer patients to the, our interventional teams, right? For the for the PPI. All right. The meaning is uh whatever just Antonio mentioned about the whatever complexity, actually the main is big and the other combining uh, combining disease actually you know that big vessel more than two or five or three or we can get a you know very enough effective scan area you know five in the you know very old data Dr. Hong actually published that one you know more than five point five you know scan area and scan length less than forty. So we still less than one percent. That is published data, right? But the we uh, here are left very low. So uh, just Antonio mentioned in the practical point of view, we did a lot of good analysis. Big vessel, effective stability, and a position of expand by hard study. It totally different, you know, uh, technical aspect in the real world. And so uh, we and also we have some. Data feedback is from our center and the multi, uh, you know, multi center registry. Data clearly back up to our practice. Right? You know, in some cases, many cases actually, uh, you know, already PCR in, in our real world practice. All right, great. Uh, I don't, uh, Antonio is here. He's gone. <laughs> All right. You want to move a second bifurcation PCR session? Um, Okay, I have another choice. I'd like to introduce the first speaker, Adrian Banning uh, from Oxford University, uh, Oxford University Hospital. He will give us 2021 clinical data and consensus document updates on high profession teacher techniques. What are new? SJ, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So my job today is to talk through some of the uh, recent publications and consensus documents. My first comment would say that rather like this old steam engine, nothing seems to stop progress in bifurcation, not in little virus like COVID-19. So this year we've seen uh, the virtual meeting of the European Bifurcation Club in October and publication of the 15th consensus document, which is now available online in your intervention and the white paper stenting technique in CCI. We've seen publication of the first Asia Pacific Bifurcation Club consensus in your intervention and successful meetings hosted by Professor Chen in uh, November. And it's nice to see the development of new bifurcation clubs, the Sky Bifurcation Club, the LATAM Bifurcation Club and the American Bifurcation Club, which have all had their first meetings in this year. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk a little bit about a review of practice. I'm going to talk about how we define perhaps a complex bifurcation, and then give a, perhaps a technical focus on particularly the side branch ostium, the positioning of the pot balloon, and then discuss how we should optimize our sequences for two stent techniques, particularly clot and the DK crush. So this paper that was published in the fall is interesting. It reflects on differences in practice between Korea and left main. And as you see in the left-hand panel, if you have left main stenting in, uh, in Japan, you're much more likely to have a single stent technique and it's more likely to be a clot if you do get a two stent technique. You're much more likely to get a two stent technique in Korea, um, and that's more likely to be a crush. So there's obviously quite a lot of variation still in practice uh, in our going forward. This is the headline data from the 15th consensus statement, where we discussed advances in simulation, the refinements in bifurcation techniques and recognizing how imaging has given us insights into the imperfections of our technique in intervention of bifurcation and opportunities in how we improve our efficacy. Within their document is a statement about how we assess complexity and it looks at the clinical setting, the disease extent and the ease of access. But I think ultimately our issues around defining a complex two stent technique or two stent lesion, which is gonna require two stents has been informed by a recent publication of the definition two trial. Notably, if you look at the criteria there in the box, you see for a left main, a side branch lesion of more than 10 and a side branch diameter stenosis of more than 70 was sufficient to be defined as a complex bifurcation. And when we look at the outcomes, you see the uh, 
difference, particularly in target vessel MI with these two techniques, the provisional versus uh, predominantly DK crush in this trial, and better outcomes using a upfront two stent technique in these complex bifurcations. And that uh, definition, if you like, what is a complex left main bifurcation is augmented by this, this systematic review and network analysis published earlier this year as well, where a side branch lesion length of more than 10 did appear to do better with a two stent technique. So I think we can already uh, start to summarize and say that a complex left main bifurcation is probably a lesion where the circumflex lesion is more than 10 millimeters in length and it has a stenosis of more than 70%. If your left main has that, this lesion, this patient, needs your best two stent approach probably up front. We've hinted at the importance of optimizing the side branch ostium and the fact that the circumflex ostium in particular is an Achilles heel for us. And the plenary work by Kang kind of uh, illustrated that some years ago. So how do we make sure that that side branch ostium is good? Well, it's got three phases, hasn't it? Firstly, we must prepare the lesion and that often requires plaque modification in the left main, perhaps rotablation or lithotripsy. We need an optimized two stent technique for delivery. And then we need post stent dilatation and imaging. But as we've heard, if we haven't done part one and part two, just trying to do it with a big pressure balloon actually can be quite difficult, particularly in the left main because of restrictive calcification. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we optimize our two stent techniques. I'm going to show you some data that uh, Goran Stankovic kindly lent me from the Visible Heart Lab in uh, Minnesota. You can see here how with angioscopy, we can look at different techniques and what goes on when we're placing stents. So this is a DK crush procedure. This is the first stent going in to the side branch, as you see on angioscopy in the right hand panel there. And of course, our next job is to crush that back with a balloon. And this is an appropriately sized 3.5 balloon being inflated to crush back the side branch stent. You'll see that going up there. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the results of that, there's actually still quite a lot of stent hanging there that hasn't been properly crushed back. And it requires a really quite a big balloon to make sure you've really crushed back this, that stent. Otherwise you are gonna put your wire in positions which are not necessarily predictable when you're beginning your DK crush. So first message there that a bigger balloon may be necessary to really be sure that we have um, crushed back. And when we look at the sequence there, what I'm gonna say is that in the DK crush, that using a high pressure inflation right at the beginning for our side branch, branch ostium, and then this big pot balloon is a way of improving our outcome. And this cartoon that Goran has put together really highlights that. So initial balloon dilatation to the bifurcation as you see, then the stent, and then notably big pressure here to make sure that side branch is properly expanded. Big balloon here to make sure we've crushed it properly. Rewiring down the, uh, the middle or proximal area there, the first, the first um, kissing balloon, the second stent, the pot, the recross, then the second kiss, then uh, the pot. And that's how we end up with the sort of result that we want from a DK crush. So two little, uh, refinements of technique there to make sure that we get this sort of result. Now, clearly, clot is the other option. And this is what a clot's going to look like once we've done it properly. But one of the issues actually is that we know that when we uh, balloon through the side of a stent, we almost always probably pull off the main vessel uh, stent off the back, as you see in this micrograph at the bottom here. That can be relevant potentially during a clot. And this is something that Gabor Toth has been looking at. And I think this is really quite interesting. That although that deformation of the side branch can be corrected by a kissing balloon, it is dependent on where you cross. And you see that here, that why we need to be sure that we're crossing uh, distally when we're doing a clot. Because ultimately you can end up with this sort of conformation of stent as you see here, and the potential for quite a lot of deformation during a clot technique going forward. And Gabor has suggested, and I think this is really quite an interesting uh, point, that if we actually do a kiss at this stage to correct that, it perhaps takes away some of the risk of the position of the wiring during the clot technique, and that actually we can get a more uh, refined result from clot by doing it with this sequence. So some interesting insights there about how perhaps we can refine clot using a double kiss during the uh, clot, but with messages that we've learned 
um, going forward from DK Crush. And this micrograph uh, just illustrates the, uh, the highlights really of that technical uh, refinement that perhaps we should consider going forward. Because obviously this is what we want to, to ultimately try and achieve. And then finally, the, this issue about the position of the final pot balloon. And this has been debated extensively. And I'd have to say, if we really can't decide where we want to put the balloon on a cartoon, what chance have we got putting the balloon in the right place in the heart when it's moving? An awful lot of distal pot seems to go on or is actually recommended in uh, various uh, my, uh, illustrations and various uh, papers. But ultimately, that pot needs to be very carefully placed. And this is uh, emphasized in this nice publication by John Ormiston, which shows that really distal, the pot being just slightly too distal, actually closes down the side branch orifice rather than opening it up. And therefore, we need to be very careful about our distal pot position during two stent techniques. And this is uh, in this cartoon from the EBC document, you can see in the middle panel here, the perfectly positioned balloon for a final pot, just proximal to the bifurcation and making sure that we haven't got the pot balloon hanging out into uncovered uh, main branch in the right hand panel there, nor is it too distal as you see in the left hand panel there where we're deforming the, uh, the side branch ostium by uh, putting the pot too distally. So really concentrating on where that pot is and not just doing that in a, a slightly slapdash way. So what I've tried to uh, hurtle through is a review really of the issues that we uh, have looked at in bifurcation technique in the last year. There is continuing variation in practice, which obviously reflects what we don't know and the fact that there is clearly a big need for us to continue to evolve technique. But I think we doubt, do now know what a complex left main bifurcation is and how it can be recognized and which ones need two stents. If your circumflex lesion is more than 10 with a stenosis of more than 70, a two stent technique is probably sensible. And I don't think there's too much debate about that. I've shown you some optimized sequences for two stent techniques, which might offer potential advantages for patients going forward. As you've heard, we look forward to the uh, outcome of EBC2, which is gonna be reported at PCR in the spring. And I'm pleased to report that uh, we have just started an RCT of IVUS guidance on left main PCI, the optimal trial, and we've recruited about 70 or 80 patients in that with a sample, total sample size ultimately of around 800. And I look forward to completing that trial. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Adrian. So uh, you want to move a second talk. Uh, Yonggi Hong from Yonsei University Severance Hospital, so Seoul, Korea. They will give us bifurcation P PCI optimization using intercoronary guidance, optimization criteria, and supporting clinical data. Dr. Hong, please. Thank you, Shiba. Uh, thank you for the in inviting me in the TCTAP uh, 2021. The, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the bifurcation PCI optimization using uh, the intracoronary imaging guidance optimization criteria and uh, supporting clinical data. My disclosure, how much do we, uh, did we use uh, the intracoronary imaging in a bifurcation region or the uh, left main region? This is a uh, data from the Europe and the Japan. The intracoronary imaging was uh, used in the 53% in the bifurcation region and the 77% in the uh, left main region. This is a, a single center experience in Korea uh, for the use of the, the IBS in a complex region. For the bifurcation region, IBS was uh, used in the 47% and the left main region 72%. In, the, in this study, in the subgroup analysis, the IBIS guidance shows uh, the favorable clinical outcome, particularly in the left main and the bifurcation region. Actually, there is a lot of the study uh, for the treatment of the uh, left main, uh, bifurcation region for according to the different the stand technique. This is the data from the uh, BBK to compare the QLOT versus uh, TTAP. The finding of the T study was a culotte, maybe better than the TTAP. Another random study uh, from the, the Nordic uh, stand technique study to compare the culotte versus crush 
the finding conclusion of the study was a good lot, maybe better than the crush study. However, DK crushes three study from the China the, uh, compared to the DK crush versus the Gulot in the distal left main bifurcation region. Conclusion of the, this study was a DK crush may be better than the uh, Gulot. This finding is uh, the uh, opposite to the, the Nordic stand uh, technique. One uh, meta-analysis, uh, the report that uh, to compare the two stand technique versus the provisional te stand technique in the bifurcation region. Conclusion of the distant uh, study was that there was a lowering mortality in favor of the provisional stenting, rather than the two stand technique. The opposite of report was that they published in the uh, several years ago, DK crush five study to compare the DK crush versus provisional study. Provisional stenting study in the distal left main. In this study, conclusion is a uh, DK crush is a uh, better than the provisional stenting. What is the, the uh, real solid conclusion based on a previous uh, random, even in the lambda study? Actually, the recommendation is uh, quite so different. Some make us uh, some confusing. Let me show uh, some cases. This is a uh, typical left main cases, bifurcation region. Actually, at the time I tried to the, this region is a, a T-stand technique. This is a pre-intervention, the image, when I, when I look at the, the final angiography appearance, quite successful and the reasonable and the acceptable result. However, after the post intervention, I was imaging around, I found that there is a lot of the stent strut was uh, protruded from the ostium of the cirque to the left main. This is a stent strut. And this is uh, the imaging run from the, the uh, LAD, you see, there is a lot of the stent strut was uh, protruded from the cirque to the left main. Imaging run from the cirque to the left main. You see a lot of the stent strut was uh, protruded, even though angiographic appearance is quite successful. This is another case is at the uh, LAD diagonal bifurcation region. I fix it is a crushing stent technique at the time when you look at the, the final angiogram, it's a residual stenosis less than a 5%, quite reasonable and successful. However, post-intervention, the IBS image, there is a hidden and a very uncomfortable finding. There is a lots of the stent strut was a protruded from the diagonal branch to the proximal LAD. This is a, the imaging run, diagonal branch to the, the LAD, protruded stent strut in here. Imaging run from the diagonal branch to the LAD, you see there is a stent strut in, in the LAD. Therefore, in regarding to the two stent technique in a true bifurcation, there is a lot of question. Which technique is the best? Which technique do you prefer or believe? What is the, the angiographic criteria? The successful angiographic criteria or Definition of the optimal bifurcation stent implantation, crushing, glot, or T stent technique. Personally, stent technique does not matter. Regardless of the stent technique, all bifurcation region should be uh, divided into two types imaging based optimal versus suboptimal result. I think uh, the angiographic appearance itself cannot discriminate between uh, the imaging basis optimal versus suboptimal result. As we know, left main disease is a typical uh, disease of a bifurcation region. Therefore, there is uh, some criteria. So famous slide is, a, this is a quantitative criteria for the left main bifurcation region, five, six, seven, eight. We need uh, another qualitative criteria. Actually, I propose that the three component of the qualitative criteria First one is that the uh, ostium of the side branch should be covered by stent strut. The reason why side branch ostium is a frequent site of the recurrence. Second one is a stent strut from the side branch ostium should be uh, the attached, fully attached the left main. Finally, this component is important. There is a uh, the little to a no stent strut just above 
or near to the side branch osseum. Let me show us this example. This is uh, the one year follow up uh, OCT examination after the crushing stand technique 3D reconstruction. This is uh, the LAD longitudinal cross sectional view. When you look at the here, proximal LAD left main, when you look at the, the uh, RC of the cirque, there is a no center strut. Another cross section from cirque, you see there is a no center strut proximal LAD. This is uh, the unfunce view, left main. This is uh, the proximal LED osteum, proximal LED uh, sac osteum. There is a no stent strut. That is uh, the optimal, the uh, left main bifurcation criteria. So the conclusion is how to make a left main bifurcation PCI perfect. First, to adjust, just to do imaging. IBIS or OCT, anyhow and try to achieve a optimal imaging criteria in both quantity and the quality of the uh, imaging criteria. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Great, great talk. All right. Uh, actually, Dr. Hong has a lot of you know, uh, experience in the state. All right, uh, next uh, speaker, Dr. LeFour, so will give us a provisional side branch setting, the big misunderstanding. Good. Thank you very much, SG. It's uh, really a great honor to be part of this uh, excellent session dedicated to bifurcation and left main disease. So the title of my talk is a provisional side branch stenting, the big misunderstanding. I think it's very important to talk about that because I think there is some, uh, a lot of discussion uh, around that. So this is my uh, disclosure. So the, the main question is how to treat this kind of bifurcation lesion. So you have a one, one, one bifurcation lesion with a long stenosis of the side branch. It's really a relevant side branch, this diagonal branch, and there is a lot of disease in this LED. So what will be the best technique to treat uh, this lesion? Uh, if we follow the recommendation of uh, European Bifurcation Club, so we have a true bifurcation lesion with a severe cyber stenosis longer than 5 to 10 millimeters. So it's clear that there is two options. If we have a low risk of cyber occlusion or if we have a high risk of cyber occlusion. Uh, in this case, it's not a low risk uh, uh, cyber risk of cyber occlusion. Uh, but if you follow this uh, schematic drawing, uh, of course, in this situation, you can do a provisional cybron stenting. On the opposite, if you have a high risk of cybron occlusion, and this is a case of uh, my example, you can use a decay crush technique for sure, but you can so also use uh, inverted provisional cybron stenting, so treating first the cybranch, and, and then you have many opportunities, so inverted culotte, inverted T, inverted TA. Uh, up to recently, uh, the uh, ESC uh, guidelines were very clear. So in, uh, when you have a bifurcation lesion, it's a 1A recommendation to use a provisional cybron stenting approach. Uh, but uh, at, that, at the same time, in case of left main PCI, when you need two stents, the recommendation is to prefer uh, the decay crush technique, and it's a 2BB recommendation. And since these uh, guidelines, uh, there is a, a, a huge uh, uh, discussion around the, the, the use of Dekakos technique uh, uh, in this field. And this is coming from the Dekakos, Dekakos 5 uh, study uh, from Dr. Shen. And you can see that there is, at one year follow-up, a big difference in terms of TLF. So the, you double the risk of TLF. But please note that these differences occur at 11 uh, months and 20 days. So before that, there is no difference. Uh, then we had more recently the definition, definition 2 study, which is a, a randomized uh, study uh, comparing different uh, techniques, so provisional versus uh, decay crush technique. And the definition 2, uh, uh, David Kansari showed the, 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 the criteria for complex bifurcation. And this is uh, very important because, uh, of course, you have a, a 1 1 1 or 0 and 1 bifurcation lesion, a relevant side branch, 2.5 millimeter or more, 
a lesion length longer than 10 uh, for not left main bifurcation and uh, and the lesion uh, uh, stenosis more than 70 percent in case of left main and also minor criteria including uh, the angle the main vessel size uh, the presence of thrombus, the presence of calcification so this uh, lesion in definition two are very complex bifurcation lesions. And the outcome was in favor of uh, DECA crush technique. Uh, not, not all cases were DECA crush, but the very uh, the high majority of, of technical uh, uh, approaches were uh, DECA crush, so more than 80%. And you can see that there was no difference in terms of death. Uh, there was a significant difference in terms of target lesion revascularization, but again, you see that it occurred at 11 months and some days. So before that, it was uh, running in parallel. And uh, of course, there is a big difference in terms of target vessel MI, which occurred at the very be beginning, but uh, not during the one-year uh, outcome. So it's very important to, uh, to understand why uh, this deca crush technique is becoming more popular. I think the first is that deca crush is clearly better than crush because you are able with the deca crush to end the procedure with final kissing belly inflation. And we learned in the past that if you do a crush technique, you should end the procedure with a, a final kissing belly inflation. Of course, we have this uh, recent study, so all the series of deca crush studies, the definition two, and more recently a meta analysis comparing different techniques. Of course, with Deca Crush, you have nearly always a very good angiographic result, but we have learned uh, from uh, Dr. Kiong that it's not enough to have a good angiographic appearance of the result. Uh, maybe people like also to perform complex procedures, and uh, maybe it uh, can be a good argument. And also, and I think this is the main problem, there is a big misunderstanding about what is provisional approach. So provisional is a technique which is a, a progressive approach. So you wire both branches, uh, you stand the main branch according to uh, the distal reference, you do pro proximal optimization technique, and maybe you can stop at this level. Of course, if you are not happy with the result uh, in the side branch, you can open the distal strut, uh, do a kiss or repot, and if you are still not happy, you can do a T, tap, or culotte with the keys and report at the end. And of course, you can do also inverted provisional. And uh, so you start with the side branch because you think that access toward the side branch is very complex. And maybe you will lose the side branch if you will stand the man first. Uh, what is Deca Crush? So it's a fixed approach using systematically two stents, and there is many steps. Uh, so you should be an expert in deca crush to do a good deca crush because you, you you have to do three pots, three keys, and of course all these steps were in, may increase the mistakes that you may have during the the procedure, and it was also shown by Dr. Kiong uh, in the previous talk. Uh, you have also three layers of stents in the crush zone, which is not optimal, and it's not well adapted to a T-shaped angulation. And this is just an example in our bench, bench uh, uh, technique that we have tested many years ago. So when you have a T-shaped angulation, the crush, of course, is done proximally, but you have not a T-shaped angle between the crush part and the non-crush part. So you may have this kind of uh, poor apposition of the stent, and then you can go outside of the strut if you go through a distal strut, for example. So what, I, what are the limitations of DK Crush 5? I think it's very important to have that in mind. So in DK Crush 5, you should have done five cases, which are uh, checked by the uh, committee before starting the study. But there is no control for provisional, and there is no recommendation about the technical approach when you do recommendation, when you do provisional. The side branch lesion length in Deca Crush 5 is 17 mm in length. So you have a, a relevant side branch, more than 10 mm in length. So you should use two stents. And in the study, in the provisional group, there was only 47 of patients who had two stents in this uh, study. Uh, 
POT was not used in the provisional group in Decaucus 5, and the angiographic follow-up, as you have seen, occurred in more than 70% of cases before the one-year clinical endpoint. And that's why you have this uh, bump of uh, TLF uh, just before the one-year follow-up. What about deficient 2? So deficient 2, uh, as you have seen, it was a crush in the vast majority of cases. The lesion length was 20 millimeter in length. So relevant side branch, complex uh, bifurcation, uh, you cannot do provisional with only one stent. And in this study, two stents were used in only one fourth of the cases. So you cannot treat this kind of lesion with only one stent. Uh, no pot were uh, done uh, before the keys in the provisional. Uh, and again, the angiographic follow-up occurred uh, before the 12 years clinical endpoint in the majority of cases. So now we have a, a very nice uh, network meta-analysis, which was uh, uh, shown by David uh, just before, uh, showing that Deca crush is better than all other techniques. But now if you look uh, clearly at uh, uh, different details, they look at the side branch lesion lane less than 10 millimeter, and you can see that uh, uh, provisional is at least as good as two-stand technique, if you have a lesion length uh, shorter than 10. On the opposite, if you have a long lesion, clearly uh, the coverage technique will be better and two stand technique will be better. So when you have a long relevant side branch lesion, it should be stent. It's very clear. So in this particular case, my, go back to my example. In this case, we have done an inverted provisional. So stenting first the side branch, doing a pot, uh, a kiss, and then uh, do a T-shape. Uh, of course, we can have done a, a culotte or a tap technique. Uh, and this is the final result, which I think is, uh, is very uh, acceptable. So my conclusion is that uh, when treating complex bifurcation lesion with a relevant side branch longer than 10 millimeter, a two stand technique should be used in the vast majority of cases. You cannot treat this kind of lesion with only one stent. In this type of lesion, the strategy uh, should not be dogmatic and depend, of course, on many parameters, including the anatomy of the lesion, but also the experience of the operator. And we know that Dr. Shen is very experienced in doing a deca crush technique. Uh, but in all cases, when you're treating bifurcation lesion, proximal optimization technique is crucial, and final cutting inflation, if you use two stents, is a must. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, that is great uh, uh, technical review about that. Uh, and we have uh, a 10 minute discussion time. Uh, so I had a question for the panel. Um, in all these trials, we, we see suboptimal use of intravascular imaging to we show this data, it really should be 100% for left main for bifurcation. Is that a problem with the guidelines or how do we get to 100% imaging for complex PCI? Well, the guidelines only reflect the data, which is why we're doing the trial. There really isn't a randomized trial at the moment of uh, imaging against no imaging. That's why we're doing our trial, the optimal trial of IVUS and there are other OCT, AJ may have a view, uh, if he's still there, about OCT. And uh, I think OCT can be equally well used in, in the left main. But the guidelines can't, um, can't come up with a 1A recommendation if there isn't a randomized trial to show clinical benefit. No, I, I think that's true. On the other hand, the, uh, the challenge is if the, from the left main trials, the use of imaging is in three quarters of the cases then it's hard to sort of argue to do it without imaging that you'd get the same results. Uh, with respect to the point of the OCT, um, it, I really like the talk that was given on imaging that one advantage of, um, of OCT in this specific circumstance um, is it actually can allow you to visualize the side branch. And there's some interesting stuff coming out where if you do a provisional approach and you see a stent strut that's directly in the middle of, and potentially obstructing flow to the ostium of the circ, maybe that's something that ought to be moved out of the way with a low pressure balloon. Obviously this has to be sorted out um, and studied, but um, for that area specifically, OCT can be pretty informative. 
And the other thing we have to do is to act on the imaging. And that's the other thing which you know David hinted at, and Greg knows from the Excel data, that imaging was done, but perhaps ignored. Uh, you know, and you know, it, taking a picture isn't going to improve the outcome. Acting on the picture improves the outcome. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think uh, a lot of people say I did imaging uh, means nothing. Uh, uh, we always said uh, in the old times that imaging doesn't work by intention to treat. Uh, we see a lot of cases where despite imaging, the result is suboptimal. So if you don't prepare the lesion with adequate uh, devices, uh, the fact that you have used the imaging uh, Right, yeah, and that's why I'd that... be very interested to you know, see the results, uh, Adrian, of, of your trial. I mean, we just finished enrollment in Lumion 4 with 2,500 randomized patients of OCT-guided complex PCI. Of course, we excluded left mains in that trial, um, uh, unfortunately, because uh, that's the one lesion subset that's not approved in the United States for OCT. And we did this off, we did this uh, as a non-IDE trial. Uh, but we had a very specific protocol as to how you use the imaging information to optimize stent dimensions, when you should treat dissections, uh, when you should debulk calcium, et cetera. So, uh, um, uh, you know, even your study will be as good as the instructions given to the operators and the follow through to make sure that they maximally use the information of the vascular imaging. I, I think the, the point of, of Antonio is also very important because uh, the technical approach is also crucial. and. Uh, and you know, Greg, that in Excel, there was 7% of cases with uh, uh, longitudinal uh, distortion of the stent. And so you see it by yeah. IVUS, but the most important is to avoid it. And it's really a technical approach which helps you to avoid this kind of complication. And, and we know that longitudinal compression is associated with a, a double risk of MACE at, uh, at five years follow-up. So, uh, so I think it's very important. And all the steps of the technique when treating bifurcation lesion may uh, open a, a, a problem that may occur. So imagine, of course, is very useful, but the technique that you use is also very important. I mean, I think the XR results could have been even better with yeah, uh, of course. you know even better um, appropriate management of the distal bifurcation, use of intravascular imaging, reliance on physiologic lesion assessment, et cetera. Uh, and we didn't use DK crush, um, was almost no patients, very few patients got any crush, let alone DK crush in Excel. But I would be interested in hearing uh, a Dr. Chen's response to where he feels DK crush sets in. And, and I would also, I don't wanna keep talking, but I would like to challenge the um, entire community as to why we don't have a large scale international trial of DK crush versus other techniques. Uh, because it's not right that uh, all the data comes out of one person. Oh, I, uh, great. So, I, 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 all right. Oh, all right. All right. But uh, you know, uh, uh, Greg, that there is an ongoing study uh, in Germany, uh, which is a randomized study comparing DK crush to uh, a provisional. And uh, 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 I proposed to my associate to be part of the study, and they said no. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know if in the UK you are including patients, uh, Adrian, in this study, but uh, they, are, they have included in uh, one year, they have included less than 20 cases. So uh, it would be very difficult to, uh, to have the data of this uh, study in, uh, in less than three or five, four years. Sure. But you know, I think uh, the whole field uh, is evolving. Uh, we have uh, FFR, many side branches are not critical at all. Uh, we have drug coated balloons that uh, now in Europe are used a lot on side branches. Uh, so I don't, I'm, I'm not so sure that you are still uh, uh, debating provisional versus two stents. Uh, I believe this question is old. Uh, and is superseded by new approaches. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah Greg, I fully, I fully agree with your idea to, to design a new study to compare DK crush with these other uh, standing technique, including provisional, culotte, or any other two stand technique. Uh, one further comment about uh, our definition two study. 
basics, basically, this study was not only to compare two stand te technique with the provision of four real complex biophagic lesion. One of the aim uh, of the definition two study to testify to confirm the efficacy of definition criteria to differentiate the simple from biophagic lesion. As a series said, so far you know, no universal definition to differentiate a symbol from complex biophagic lesion. So from this study, I'm very, very confident about the, the definition criteria to help us during our daily practice. Recently, I just read the paper published by Dr. Xu Bo about the validation of definition criteria. So Dr. Xu, could you introduce a little bit more about your analysis? Uh, yes, so our data also support the use of uh, criteria, uh, definition criteria in uh, left man, uh, true left man bifurcation uh, lesions. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are focusing on large bifurcation, I mean, large side branch already. I mean, a lot of uh, abrupt closure of the side branch is a smaller uh, diagonal, smaller side branch in the cast lab. So according to our, our observational study or randomized data, uh, around 80% of this uh, abrupt side branch occlusion uh, occurred between the reference vessel diameter between uh, uh, 2.5 to uh, 2.0 millimeter. So what is your, uh, I mean, uh, practical approach to this kind of particular bifurcation lesions? beyond the two stand versus one stand strat. Great insight from the, you know, uh, Jubosta, Jubosta uh, uh, suggestion and data analysis, all right. It really, what I want to talk, is just a showing 10 definition study. You included the big vessels. The first vessel diameter is more than two five. The meaning is at least the uh, percent fractional myocardial mass consumed by CT, maybe Bigger than 10%, right? The meaning is, right, look at this, bifurcation, whole conceptual curve. Big vessel, then main bifurcation, truly, bifur you know, truly medina class 111011, up front to 2 cents, it's okay. No matter what, you know, DK crush it, the other crushing, you know, the meaning is, the reason why main bifurcation is big enough vessel, you know, 3.7, you know, seven and side range is more than three or something. We don't have any, maybe we don't have any difference in terms of a different technique. However, in terms of the other, you know, LED diagonals, you know, a circumference of obtuse marginal bifurcation concern, look at this, more than 80% any side branch, just a Juba mentioned about that, the percent fractional micro max less than 10%. The meaning is main branch stand is mainly related to clinical relevance. More than 80% of a side branch is not related to clinical relevance. Theory, right? And just the big vessels, more than two five, even in the LAD diagonals, maybe 20% of any bifurcation, you know, LAD diagonals, obtuse marginal circumference. So whole bifurcation among them around 20 percent would be you know more than more than 10 percent of fractional micro mass the meaning is big side branch is big vessel just uh, you know shell and chain include 2.5 something you know do it you know truly 111 is 011 one, one. you're gonna do the upfront to two stem remaining remaining sense actually we didn't you know touch about that too much aggressive treatment to have uh, you know have a higher you know uh, base rate, you know that with some published data, such an aggressive treatment side branch in the small vessel may have a you know higher base rate. And so personally, basically, conceptually, I don't want to touch in terms of a small vessel side branches, you know, even after main branch stenting and another, you know, provisional dilation, some balloon injury, then maybe, you know, uh, in, induced some disaster in <laughs> a clinical relevance concerns. So what I'm talking, bifurcation, non me we have to consider 80% cases, less than 10% fractional micro mass is not clinical relevance, it's mainly 
clinical relevance is related to the main brain system, right? All right. <laughs> My, uh, yeah, so I, I, have, I have last suggestion uh, yeah. from a very, very nice presentation by Siri. Uh, one figure is wrong. So uh, your, your, that figure showing very big gap between side stand and vessel wall after crush. It's not after decay crush. That figure came from John, Dr. John Armstrong, who showed the big gap of the classic crush. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have a, you know, this exciting session. And we really uh, thank you for joining us. It's a famous and distinguished faculties and lecturers. Um, maybe uh, next year's our meetings, so we have to meet, you know, face to face. And, I hope so. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you.